Hey, this is an extra video, a bonus video, only for our paid subscribers, which means everybody. I was trying to be funny. So the thing is, this is about Melchizedek. I had made another video on him and featured it in an earlier Living Scriptures class, but trying to find that would be impossible. So I'm just going to make a new one because... Aaron in particular has been asking about him, but the rest of you who might be interested in looking into this more deeply, I found a site that gives some info, and I'm also going to make some commentary myself. First of all, you know, Melchizedek is mentioned in the Mass, at least in Eucharistic Prayer 1. So if you go to an English language Mass, you will occasionally hear the name Melchizedek. In fact, The pray, in, after the consecration, the priest prays, look with favor on these offerings and accept them as you once accepted the gifts of your servant Abel, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the bread and wine offered by your priest Melchizedek. Now you guys know who Abel is. Uh, he offered a sacrifice to God and was murdered by his brother Cain out of jealousy. You should know who Abraham is, our father in faith. Father Abraham begins, in fact, the Jewish religion, the Muslim religion, and the Christian religion in a sense. All three monotheistic faiths look to Abraham as the source of their faith. But who the heck is this Melchizedek mentioned in Hebrews and elsewhere? At any rate, he's got to be important. He's in the mass along with Abel and Abraham and then Melchizedek. Why is he so important? And what is St. Paul, or the author of the epistle to the Hebrews, saying about him? This site, which is, um, you can't see the top of it, but it's Catholic straight answers. Catholic straight answers. Who was Melchizedek? First of all, they mention he appears in Genesis 14, 18 through 20. And Abraham at that point, has defeated uh, a king and three other kings, and he's met by Melchizedek, the Canaanite king of Salem and a priest of God most high. He's the king of Salem. They point out, interestingly, the word Melchizedek means my king is righteousness and Salem means peace. So he's the king of peace, and his name means my king is righteousness. But he's a Canaanite king meaning he's not Jewish. So out of nowhere, here's this dude, Melchizedek. He appears to Abraham after Abraham and some others have won an important battle. And he appears as a priest. Now, this is before the Jewish priesthood. The Jewish priesthood is established after the Jews are led by Moses out of Egypt and Levi, who's one of the 12 sons of Jacob, the tribe of Levi, meaning the descendants of Levi, the son of Jacob, they're the ones who become priests in the Jewish religion. So it's a heretical, heretical, hereditary thing. If you are born a Levite into the family of Levi and you're Jewish, you are a priest because of that. And you are a priest of the Jewish order. Our priesthood in the Catholic Church is different, but we'll get to that in a minute. But let's look at the fact that Melchizedek is king of Salem. Now, some scholars think that Salem means Jerusalem, Jeru Salem. If he comes from Jerusalem, then he's coming from the area that later becomes the center of the Jewish faith, where the temple is eventually built. And it becomes the center of the Jewish nation and the center of their religion. And it becomes the place where Jesus is crucified, where the great sacrifice happens. So if in fact he's the king of Salem, meaning the king of Jerusalem, then all the way back in Abraham's time, which would have been about 2,000 years before Christ, we have a mysterious priest coming out of Jerusalem whose name means um, 
my king is righteous and who is the king of peace. My king is righteousness. And yet, even though he's Canaanite, somehow he's serving God. He brings bread and wine to Abraham and blessed him with these words, blessed be Abram, that was Abraham's name at the time, by God most high, the creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who delivered your foes into your hand. Melchizedek acknowledges one God or the God most high. In other words, he acknowledges that there is a God above all other gods, because at the time, the Canaanites and the other pagans, the nations, as they were called, would have recognized multiple gods. In fact, the idea that there's one God has really only just happened because Abraham has encountered this one God. But at least Melchizedek says, he doesn't necessarily say there's one God and one God only, but he says, you will be blessed by the highest God above all gods. And we now understand that really the highest God is the only God. And anything else that we might think of as being a lesser God is really an aspect of him. But at the time, certainly the non-Jews didn't realize this. Really, only Abraham was the one who realized the significance of the one God. He blesses Abraham in the name of the highest God of whom Melchizedek serves as a priest. Mel Abraham then offers Melchizedek one-tenth of the spoils that they've just taken in this battle. So they've got this booty or these spoils, and Abraham gives Melchizedek a tenth of it, which is a tithe, which you would only give to someone greater than you or someone representing a higher power than you. So Hebrews points out that in tithing to Melchizedek, Abraham, our ancestor, represents all of us who are descended from him, all Jews or really all Christians, because Abraham is our father in faith. In tithing to Melchizedek, we all, in a sense, recognize that he is the priest of the true God, even though he's a priest from before the Jewish institution of the priesthood. And he's a priest from the pagans. But this is one way of saying what we already know and what the Catholic Church admits. People search for God throughout history. Just because people outside of the Jewish or Christian faith don't know God fully doesn't mean that they're not trying to find him and worship him. So we don't know. We can't judge people in other faiths. We can't even judge people who say, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I mean, I used to say that, but I was searching for the truth. Well, there is truth, and that this truth is God. Well, Melchizedek knew him and served him, and that's mysterious enough that he appears out of nowhere, and as Hebrews points out, he has no genealogy. We're not told when he appears in Genesis who his parents are or who his descendants are. He comes, he offers bread and wine, which would have been a common sacrifice in those days, but still, I mean, bread and wine make up our sacrifice at every mass. And the bread and wine becomes consecrated, but that's the basic stuff that make up the consecrated body and blood of Christ. And that's what Melchizedek has. That's weird. It's like, what's that doing 2,000 years before Christ, who is this guy? But then it gets more complicated because we have Psalm 110, which this article mentions. I will also give you guys the link to this article. Melchizedek is mentioned again in Psalm 110. The Lord has sworn and he will not repent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This psalm is considered one of the most important of the messianic psalms, Psalms about the Messiah, identifying the forthcoming Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ, as king, priest, and conqueror. In other words, God is talking to Jesus in this psalm. It's kind of weird to imagine that. This psalm would have been written 
hundreds of years before Christ appeared. But even if you don't believe in Jesus or you don't believe in God, if you're just a scholar looking at scripture, you'd say, what the heck? Melchizedek? He hasn't been mentioned since the Abraham episode in Genesis. He's not mentioned anywhere else in the Old Testament, except in Psalm 110, where God says to his Messiah, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So the Messiah will be a priest outside of the Levitical or Jewish priesthood. And he will be a priest forever, because as the author of Hebrews indicates, Melchizedek himself is a timeless figure. He seems to come from nowhere and go to nowhere. There's an eternity to his priesthood. He's a priest before the fullness of revelation has been given to the Jews. And God promises the Messiah, the expected deliverer. The Messiah was a figure we talk about in Isaiah, we're studying what we call second Isaiah, written to the Jews when they're in captivity in Babylon. The Jews, Jerusalem has been destroyed. The temple has been physically destroyed. The Jews are forced to move into Babylon. They're living as prisoners. They're living as slaves. But they are promised, including in Deutero Isaiah, a Messiah, a deliverer who will make everything well. Well, this Messiah figure that the Jews continually expect for hundreds of years, this deliverer, this Messiah, and Messiah means anointed one, or Christos in Greek is the Greek word for Messiah, Christos, which is why Jesus is called Christ, because it comes from the Greek Christos, meaning anointed, meaning Jesus is the deliverer, the Messiah, the Savior. This Messiah in the Psalms written perhaps a thousand years before the birth of Christ, halfway between Abraham and Jesus, in the Psalms, God says to his Messiah, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So then the author of the book of Hebrews says, I've figured out the mystery. Who is this Melchizedek mentioned only twice in the Old Testament? Who is he? He's Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean Literally, Jesus came to Abraham to receive a tithe and to bless Abraham. No, it doesn't mean that, that Melchizedek was the second person of the Holy Trinity incarnate, but it means that's who Melchizedek foreshadows, typifies, and represents. And so this um, website goes a little further and talks about it. Um, I'm just looking at the parts that I'm going to kind of read. Um, he makes, I mean, he really kind of spells it out here. Um, I'm probably just going to have to read this stuff. Oh, okay. Perhaps St. Paul, the traditional author of the letter to the Hebrews, was the greatest promoter of Melchizedek. See Hebrews chapters five through nine. St. Paul used the person of Melchizedek to illustrate the doctrine of the sacrificial priesthood as established by Christ. St. Paul begins, every high priest is taken from among men, meaning Jewish high priests, and made their representative before God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Remember, this book is called Hebrews because Paul or whoever wrote it is writing to the Hebrews, meaning the Jews. And he's saying, all of your high priests are human beings. Despite human weakness, a man is called by God to be a priest. That's the case in the Catholic Church, too. St. Paul then compares and contrasts the priesthood of Melchizedek with that of Aaron, the Levitical priesthood. In other words, the, um, Aaron is a descendant of Levi. So Aaron's children are the priests. That's the Levitical priesthood. The priesthood of Aaron was based on his ancestry from Abraham. The priests following Aaron were of his family, the house of Levi, an appointed priest because of their heredity. Also, these priests offered the sacrifices of the old covenant, not the sacrifices of the new. In contrast to the Levitical priesthood is the priesthood of our Lord, which Melchizedek foreshadows. And then he gives several points. He is, the author of this website is 
um, recapitulating Paul's argument in Hebrews. First, Melchizedek has no genealogy in the Old Testament and his priesthood is not based on heredity. Christ, like Melchizedek, is a priest by divine appointment and his priesthood does not depend upon hereditary tithes. This is why the Catholic priesthood, any man can become a priest if called by God. You don't have to be of a certain tribe or hereditary um, genealogy. Second, Abraham recognized the priest King Melchizedek by receiving his blessings and offering him tithes. An act of such humility signified that the priesthood which would descend from Abraham is of lesser stature than that of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was greater than Abraham and therefore greater than any of the priests descended from Abraham. This act also foretold that the Levitical priesthood would be replaced by the greater perfect and royal priesthood of Christ. Third, Melchizedek offered bread and wine and thanksgiving to God, prefiguring what our Lord did at the Last Supper Fourth, Melchizedek was a member of the nations. Christ came to save not just the house of Israel, but the people of all nations. That's why Melchizedek is not Jewish. Moreover, Melchizedek's very name and title mean king of justice, king of peace. Jesus entered the world to bring justice and peace. Finally, finally Melchizedek was not a priest of the old covenant. Christ as a priest offered the perfect sacrifice for sin and made the new perfect and everlasting covenant with his own blood. And then he quotes here later in this article how uh, the church fathers understood Melchizedek in the same way. In other words, to unpack that, by the time we get to the epistle to the Hebrews, which comes after Christ, 2,000 years after the appearance of Melchizedek, a thousand years after the psalm where God says you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, by the time we get there, St. Paul or whoever writes to the Hebrews says, I've figured it out. Melchizedek is a mysterious figure, but I know the solution to the mystery. He does not represent the Jewish priesthood. He represents a priesthood that's eternal, that has no beginning and no end. He represents a priesthood that's not tied to our human nature alone because Jesus can make a perfect sacrifice. He is our perfect high priest because he's sinless. He's not a sinful human being who offers sacrifices that have to be repeated every day because they're imperfect because of our sins. His sinlessness and his sacrifice on the cross is the eternal and perfect sacrifice that is represented at every mass. And in a way, you know, the theology is, it's not a human priest who offers mass. The offering of the consecrated bread and wine at mass is offered by Jesus himself in the person of the priest. The priest represents Jesus offering himself to God as Jesus did at Calvary. Jesus offers himself to the Father in atonement for our sins. He says on the cross, Father, here is my body and blood offered to you as a sacrifice for human mankind. And therefore, the author of the epistle to the Hebrews sees Melchizedek as representing this eternal priesthood and sacrifice, which is not embodied until Jesus himself comes along in the first century to embody it and carry it out. But the great thing is, from that point forward, from the crucifixion on, Jesus remains our high priest, and that sacrifice is replicated. It is represented and lived over again in the Eucharist from that point forward. That then, is what is meant by the eternal nature of the mysterious priest called Melchizedek, who serves God even before God reveals himself to the Jews and the Christians, or for that matter, the Muslims. He serves God in a timeless way, and therefore he's a type of Christ. He particularly represents Christ as king of peace, king of righteousness, king of Jerusalem, king of kings, 
and he represents Christ, the high priest. Whoa! Now, this has been a long video, and I would not make my poor, miserable students in living scripture watch a video this long, but it's a little extra. It's a little bonus for our subscribers who give me, well, you know, it's, you know how the internet works. You got to give money to see the paid content. Well, you know, I'm kind of making fun of that. But it's for those of you like Aaron who really wanted to know more. You want to spend a half an hour watching me talk about it. Now that's just Melchizedek. Everything in the Bible is that amazing and can be unpacked and understood in that thorough of a manner. I mean, if I really let myself go, every video I made for class would be about four hours long. So be happy that I don't do that. Anyway, that's a little more on Melchizedek. 